Did you know that your urinary problems can be caused almost entirely sometimes because of your bowel symptoms? If you look at anatomy, the rectum sits right behind the bladder. And so a lot of problems in your colon or your rectum can cause problems in your bladder. So I did an Instagram Live with Dr. Kum Kum Patel, a gastroenterologist who answered all of my questions about constipation and pelvic floor dysfunction causing issues with your bowels. There are a lot of things we covered, so make sure you check out the timestamps in the description to see which of those things are most interesting to you. We talked about how to treat constipation, when to get a colonoscopy, how to manage pelvic floor dysfunction, and a lot more. So check it out and let me know what you think. If you want to see more of my Instagram lives, make sure that you comment below so that I know and I can put more of them on for you to see. So for me, you know, patients who have bladder issues, I counsel all of them on their bowels. I counsel them on constipation all the time. Um, do you see the same thing on your end? Yes, um, constipation, yes, all the time. But in terms of urinary incontinence, so many people don't realize that, you know, if they're having trouble peeing and uh, the other end might also be related. So a lot of constipated patients might also be having urinary incontinence. And, um, you know, so they're not aware that their pelvic floor is all intertwined. Yeah, so our pelvic floor is like a bowl of muscles that holds all of our organs. So for men and women, it's the bladder and the rectum. And women, there's also the uterus, um, if you have one still. And so they are very much so interconnected. And not just with incontinence, I see a lot of people who go into urinary retention or who aren't able to urinate because they're so backed up and they haven't had a bowel movement in a very long time. So let's yes. talk about what exactly is constipation because that's different for different people. So what exactly, you know, people don't really know what the true definition of constipation is. So that's really interesting that you asked that, you know, constipation, uh, normal bowel movements can be anything from once every three days to up to three times a day. So anything outside that's less than that is considered constipation. Technically anything that's more than that is diarrhea. So it's even normal bowel movements are so varied that if it's a stray from your norm and it's less in frequency, then that's technically constipation. But the Rome Foundation defines it as being hard stools, um, less than two bowel movements, and, you know, certain characteristics. We have a Bristol stool chart where you could actually characterize what your poop looks like. And I don't like to use the actual chart. I use to, I like to use food items. So I say, does your poop look like milk duds? Does it look like a Babe Ruth bar? Does it look like a Snickers bar with cracks in it? Does it look like a soft snake? So um, when you're constipated, it's usually um, looks like Babe Ruth. It looks like a milk duds, which is the small pellet like stools, or it's a very hard piece that has um, almost like rough edges around it because it's so compact and put together and it comes out like pellets. That's uh, yeah. I like the food thing. I haven't thought of that. I'm usually like, does it, does it like rabbit poop? That's <laughs> what yep, I use. Rabbit poop, yep. Yep, yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, what yes. is your go-to treatment for constipation? So that's really great that you asked me because constipation is one of those things people assume that it's automatically like, a oh, if I take more fiber or if I take more Miralax, everything's going to be okay. Maybe if you have what we call slow transit constipation uh, or normal transit constipation. But if you have irritable bowel syndrome constipation type, then you may need something uh, more advanced, like medications like Placanotide, which is Trulance, or uh, Linaclotide, which is Linzess. Maybe you need uh, something if you have, let's say, anxiety or depression that's actually slowing down your bowels uh, from your irritable bowel syndrome. Maybe you need an SSRI, like Zoloft, which is sertraline, to kind of help speed up your bowels. Okay, so pelvic, and then moving to pelvic floor dysfunction. So in my world, we talk about pelvic floor dysfunction, and it's very often people don't know they have it. I describe it as like TMJ. Like people get stressed, and they carry that stress in their vagina or their anal rectal um, area. And so I tell people this can present as overactive bladder, like needing to go very often, having urge, having sometimes pelvic pain, and sometimes constipation. How, uh, how do you describe it? 
So pelvic floor dyssynergia is like the scientific term. It just means that the pelvic floor muscles are not coordinating together like they should be. What they're supposed to do is when there's poop in the rectal vault, your pelvic floor muscles, your rectal muscles are supposed to relax when they say, okay, here's poop, I need to poop. They should open together, the poop should come out, and the pelvic floor muscles should close. Now, in some people, their brains have been rewired abnormally. So when they feel poop, what happens is they say, okay, I need to push out, and then only a little bit of it opens. And so now they're pushing against a half-closed wall. And they said, okay, only a little few pellets came out because now their muscles are back to looking like this. So pelvic floor dyssynergia, the muscles are not quite coordinating properly, and that's why they're having trouble pooping. Oftentimes that comes from birth or having lifelong constipation or trauma from, let's say, sexual trauma. Uh, so all those things can kind of contribute to it. Yes, yeah, so I definitely do colonoscopies because I want to make sure that there is no evidence of colon cancer or a rectal tumor or some other type of obstruction. Um, a lot of times in women who've had pelvic floor surgery before may have something called adhesions, which are pieces of tissue that are kind of causing minor blockages. And if that's what's causing for the constipation to happen, then it's a different pathway. But that needs to be done first. Um, in my field, just to make sure that there isn't that happening before we can say, yes, this is a problem of irritable bowel or slow transit constipation. When do you do something like anal rectal manometry and what exactly is that? So very good, good question. So usually after I do a colonoscopy and we realize that, you know, they don't actually have any kind of tumor blockage, anything like that, but they say very, um, quintessential things, you know, doc, I poop and I have to bring my legs up to my chest or bring them, lift my legs up during um, when I'm trying to go poop. Or they say, oh, doc, I have to lean forward or kind of move from side to side in order to let the poop come out. Um, those, or I've even heard, I have to use my fingers to kind of help the poop come out. If I hear those things, that sounds like they're trying really hard, but the pelvic floor muscles are not necessarily cooperating to come out. So that's when I say, you know what, let's just make sure you don't have a pelvic floor dysfunction. But for almost every patient, technically per the algorithm that we have, every patient should get a, um, a colonoscopy and then an anal rectal manometry. Now, how it works, there's a probe about this large that is used um, to insert into the rectum and the patient is lying on their side. They are, um, you know, usually cleaned out with some laxative. I see what laxatives do I recommend? I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and so they, uh, we give them some enemas to kind of clear them out. We insert the, the tube and then we ask them to relax around it. Easier said than done when something's in your bottom. But we say, okay, now pretend like you're going to squeeze and try to push out a piece of poop. So we try to measure the strength of the pelvic floor muscles when they're around, when they're actually attempting the same movements that they do with poop. And using that, we can actually measure how strong or how weak their muscles are. And if it's too strong, right? Sometimes you're squeezing too hard and that's actually preventing from the poop to come out. So um, that can actually also be an issue uh, as well. So we kind of want to be able to check that before we say, okay, um, this is irritable bowel or some other reason for the constipation. So yeah, I guess we had a question about what laxatives you recommend. So maybe you can touch on that. So uh, primarily, I would recommend Miralax because it is an osmotic laxative, which means that it draws the water out of your bowels. And it actually, it, called, it, it reduces the surface tension. What does that mean? That means it makes it smoother against the wall of the colon, and it makes it easier for the poop to actually come out of your body. Okay, that's most recommended. We actually use a, a variant of that for actually colonoscopy prep. So as you can imagine, if we use it to clean out your bowels prior to your procedure, we definitely think it's strong enough for you to use on a daily basis to uh, stay regular. So I would recommend Miralax. Um, there are things like stimulant laxatives like Vizicodal, um, and that's called Dul Dulcolax. And you can most certainly use that as well to kind of jumpstart your bowel. But um, you should also consider just taking fiber um, in your diet. You can have psyllium husk, which is Metamucil, 
that's an insoluble fiber that should help kind of, you know, absorb things and make a gel and help and move it along the bowel them themselves. So I hope that answers your question. Fiber. I got to touch on this really quickly. I tell people like it's literally impossible to get enough fiber in your diet unless you're eating vegetables like all day long. So I recommend that almost everyone should be on fiber, but you do hear these, you know, these like fads of like low fiber. And, and what are your thoughts on that? Oh, you know, uh, fiber is one of those like under talked about things that I think that even gastroenterologists some don't understand properly. There's two big things. There's two types of fiber. There's soluble fiber and there's insoluble fiber. Now, soluble fiber are the things that when we eat them, um, they're not like what they call roughage, okay? So that it exists in um, uh, fruits like berries, citrus, rice bran, okay? They're like the easier, more um, uh, easily digestible fibers that you can get. And you can, and even psyllium, psyllium husk, um, when you drink those, um, they uh, tend to form a gel inside the bowel and um, it actually slows down the absorption of all um, excess blood sugar nutrients and actually helps move things smoothly along the colon. Then there's insoluble fibers. Now, this is what you think of when you think of the word roughage, okay? Insoluble fibers are things like bran, wheat bran, um, the hard parts that are in Brussels sprouts um, and in asparagus. So um, when you're eating that, they can't, if you eat too much of that, you can experience diarrhea. So you need both of them to kind of help keep your bowels moving, okay? But if you're only having um, soluble fibers and it hasn't helped much, consider introducing more of the insoluble fibers to kind of help uh, move things along. Yeah, no, that's so, that's so good. So what about like fiber capsules and fiber gummies? Do you <clears throat> fiber recommend capsules them? gummies are great because they have a combination of both uh, soluble and insoluble fibers. And, um, you know, we need both of them. The ADA, which is the American uh, Dietary Association, recommends that we have at least 25 milligrams of fiber a day for women and 38 grams of fiber a day for men. That's a lot. So a lot. look at the... Um, labels on your foods some of the fiber one bars they're, they're a great way so if you want a snack and you need fiber grab a fiber one bar right or um make some brussels sprout chips like saute them or put them in the oven and kind of make um chips or um get kale chips you know make it yummy so that you're going to want to have it and then try that what about children with constipation? What do you do with children with constipation? I know you're an adult gastroenterologist, but kind of generally speaking. Yeah, so kids, um, so as a mom, I will say uh, my child is constipated and I give him lots of prune and apple juice and it usually tends to work. Now, if it does not work, I would most definitely be a pediatric gastroenterologist because they need to be uh, you know, addressed for things like Hirschsprung's disease where the actual nerves themselves have not formed properly and are causing the colon to back up full of poop. And this is an abnormal diagnosis. So they need to be addressed for that, okay? So um, this is something, especially if you have a child with Down syndrome, this is something to look out for. I'm not a pediatric gastroenterologist, so I can't speak more about that. But I would say, you know, try the basic things. Try a higher fiber diet. Try prune and apple juice. The Gerber uh, brand has these teeny tiny bottles of prune and apple juice mix that my child still drinks at the age of four and a half. And he has a bowel movement pretty much a few hours later. I would also recommend Pedialax, which is a kid's version of the Miralax. Um, they are these little chewable tablets that you can have. And it's great because one to two of those and my child is then pooping well. So... Um, I would definitely try that. But then if it's more serious, definitely recommend seeing a Pete's gastroenterologist. For people who can't afford physical therapy or can't take time away from their job, what have you kind of decided or tried to offer them when they just can't make that time? Sure. Um, there are some great uh, pelvic floor exercises. You can look them up on YouTube. They teach you how to do Kegel uh, uh, test properly, Kegel exercises properly, how to do relaxation techniques, how to do stretches for your pelvic floor. And also um, a shout out to my pelvic floor muscles. She's on Instagram. You can follow her. 
She has great recommendations in terms of pelvic floor exercises and how to kind of stretch out your muscles so that you can prevent constipation. There are a lot of free resources out there. So use your internet, use the YouTube, use, um, you know, use Instagram, find uh, ways to kind of do exercises to kind of help do that. Do kegels to kind of help strengthen your pelvic floor muscles uh, if you're not able to see a pelvic floor therapist. So I would say the, the thing about kegels is that not everyone should be doing kegels. So I just, I do caution that because if you have a high tone pelvic floor, you will actually make it worse by doing Correct. kegel exercises. So if you're not sure, at least coming in an evaluation, you don't need to necessarily commit to 12 weeks of physical therapy, even going one or two times to the physical therapist may tell you enough to learn the exercises. This question is, what is your general approach when patients show you some non FDA approved supplements and medications? to treat their constipations like ginger and peppermint oil <clears throat> so peppermint oil actually has been studied uh, by the fda and randomized control trials um, to be used for patients with ibs and it can be used so if you're using peppermint oil that's totally fine but um, we cannot guarantee that that's going to sufficiently take care of all of your symptoms and that's assuming that your um, constipation is ibs constipation type so when should people be like let's try to fix this at home versus when should they see a gastroenterologist? I mean, you guys are super busy. It's hard to get appointments sometimes. So when is like, hey, I need to go and make the time to go see a GI doctor? Um, you know, if you've tried something at home for months, you've tried changing your diet, you've tried over-the-counter therapies, you've tried the Benefiber, the fiber gummies, you've tried the exercise, and it's not working after a few months, and you realize that no matter what you do, you're still you know, lifting up your legs, trying to shimmy out your poop, it's time to go see a, a GI doc. It's always a good idea, especially if you're of age. If you're age greater than 45, now the American Cancer Society says you can get screened for colon cancer. And younger and younger people are coming in with colon cancer. I mean, I'm seeing them uh, for, you know, post-op issues or whatever. Um, and, and this is real. So don't, if, especially if you see blood in your stool, go see a GI doctor. It's so, so important. Um, what if people are getting results at home, but they need to continue taking supplements, fiber, Miralax? Is that okay for them to just continue doing that and being at home, or should they come see you at that point? Um, I would recommend com coming and seeing me at that point because, you know, there's only so much you can do. And let's say you're, you're not catching something overlapping or you're not catching something that's more serious um, that needs to be addressed. Um, that's when you should come and make an appointment. Nowadays, with the pandemic, you can make a televisit, right? Um, you can make a telehealth visit. So if time is of the issue and you don't want to take time out of your day to um, uh, go and do uh, an in-person visit, then, you know, most definitely come on in and get your uh, colon cancer screening done. All right. Woohoo! For screening. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Thank you guys so much for watching. And always remember to take care of yourself because you're worth it.